have the winning couple from the not so new newlywed game here. If you need marriage advice, go to Dave and Greta Wright. <laughs> Don't come to Pastor Nancy and her husband. We came in last. Um, it was a lot of fun. I hope more of you will join us the next time we have it. It was a lot, it was a lot of fun. Um, we've been, I don't know if you noticed or not, but in our prayer list in the bulletin, we're starting to put in bold the people who have just recently been added so that they come to your attention. So please uh, take note of that and continue to pray your prayer list. We had the midweek uh, Lenten service here last Wednesday. We had about 24 come to lunch and another 12. So we had a total of 38. Is that right? No, 14 more. 38 come to the service midweek, which is the best attended one so far. So that was exciting. Uh, we were actually able to collect $253 in offerings to go to release time. Uh, just from that Wednesday afternoon service. So thank you again to those of you who um, made items, soups and desserts, and uh, I advertised Jenny's red velvet cake on Facebook because I thought that would bring in a few people. I'm sure it did. So thank you again. Do we have any announcements from you all? Could I have Gamble to the prayer list? You spell it for me. K-A-Y-L-A. Uh-huh. Thank you. She's a young mother and she is having a problem with her eyesight. She has four young children. She's trying to wrangle and she was at the hospital three different times this week. Her eye has a black spot in it mm. and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And she's getting really bad headaches and can't see properly. Mm. Okay, thank you, Darla. Good. Kyle? Uh, we have, uh, we're doing the mulch and a couple of landscaping things today around the church at 2 o'clock. Uh, we have a pretty decent group already, but if anyone else is available to help, that would be appreciated. Okay, it's wonderful to see that stuff get done. Joe? Okay, we are, do have the list of candy making going around again. So Tuesday at 9, we'll be making mustard stems and chocolate pops. Friday at So candy making takes place Tuesday at 9, Friday at 6, and Saturday at 8 a.m. Yes. So we ready to be picked up Sunday morning. Okay, and then um, I'll be getting the long, fresh palms delivered this week. If there's anyone that knows how to make the palm crosses, I know Tori knows how. Does anybody else know how? <laughs> no, I guess she's the only one that knows how to make them. Okay, well, we won't stick her with him. A, a normal palm is like 10 cents, and if you get it made into a cross, it's like $1.50. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll buy the palms and see if anybody knows how to make the crosses. Maybe that'll have to be a project for next year. Right. Pam? Um, can I add Avery Pearson to the prayer list also? A V E R Y P E A? Yes. R S O N? Any other announcements? Yeah, Dan. Um, you can add uh, Blaze, or uh, Blaine, Atkinson, B-L-A-Y-N-E. Hold on a second. Blaine is L. Blaine. Oh, Blaine. B-L. B-L-A-Y-N-E. Atkinson. My sister, principal's daughter. Um, she's three years old. She's in the hospital with pneumonia. Can you spell the last name for me? A-T. For this month, it's Ronnie Rhodes, Ray Rommel, Amber Nessler, Dawn Perone, Caden Coons, Captain Furrier, Piper Bollinger, 
And then for the anniversary, it's Ronnie and Doris Rhodes, John and Dawn Palman, Michael and Sandy Oxidine. And then for next month, the birthdays are Audrey Rommel, Connie Levy, and Cheryl Schmink. All right. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Mm -hmm. and forgiveness is found in your bulletins. And join me in making the sign of the cross in remembrance of your baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, Christ, there's no chasm or barrier between us and God. Forgiveness is a sign and promise that God is full of life, not death, about mercy, not imposing penalties. Jesus, too, was tempted and overcame all things by trusting God's mighty power to love, to be forgiven by all three persons of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of oops, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. This morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were all very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I shall lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and I will put breath into you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. 
and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know. Oops, apologize. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Here ends our first reading. Please join me in reciting Psalm 130 together by verse. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? I wait for you, O Lord. My soul waits. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. Lord, let us be watched in the morning. Lord, let us be watched in the morning. O oh, Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. For the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. The second reading today comes from Romans chapter 8. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies and also through his Spirit that dwells in you. Here is the street. Lazarus is dead. 
For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher's here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you lain him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. Jesus tells us that over time they've come to love each other, and over time they've gotten close. I want you to think about persons not related to you with whom you've grown close. You too have probably known each other for years and repeatedly been in each other's company. You know many of the same people. Your siblings know their siblings, and you know where they live because you've been to their home. You've shared significant life events. Perhaps you graduated or worked together, attended some of the same weddings or funerals, got married, or had kids around the same time. If you became close friends, the amount of time you spent together grew, and your conversations became more intimate. Eventually, you may have become part of each other's family gatherings, and now you share quite a few memories. As a sister's word, sent word in anticipated delivery of their message, they expected a prompt, if not immediate, response. 
These days, there's a similar message that we send when prompt attention is desired. It reads something like, please give me a call as soon as possible. If I send that to my kids or any of you, I'd at least expect to receive this reply. Is everything all right? That's exactly how Jesus managed to upset his close friends. The sisters just told him everything wasn't all right. Wasn't that the same as saying, please come as soon as possible? They'd already given him a reason why. What added to the sisters' confusion and misunderstanding was Jesus knowing that Lazarus wouldn't remain dead and his sisters not knowing. But come on, Jesus, what were you thinking? Why would you torture them to suffer fear over losing their brother? Why would you make them go through the pain of watching him die? also disappoint the great hope that they had in you. The biggest disappointment any of us ever experience will be of the very same nature. That God could have done something to change the outcome, but didn't. That God could have prevented a loved one from dying, but didn't. And because God did not intervene, no reason will suffice. So let's look at the scene from another point of view. God's. There is great love between them. That's true. And without a doubt, it's true on Jesus' part. That Jesus undergoes personal risk by returning to Judea is true. And by being like himself, he's the one who knows how to navigate dangerous territory. Jesus knows the ultimate outcome, and we don't. He gives us hints, but people misunderstand them, so he tries to explain things plainly. He encourages and offers clarification so that those following him will not be misled or falsely hope. Martha's communication with Jesus models our personal journey of faith and mimics the structure of our prayers. At first, we rely on the strength of our relationship with God to get God's attention. As Martha said, it's his love for us that's most apparent. Lord, he whom you love is ill. This sentence addresses Jesus by title and acknowledges his love for both the one who is ill, the persons who love them, and the sender of the message. And in the meantime, God does something. He sends sisters and brothers to console the sister, or us, as the case may be. And after the worst fear has been realized, Martha can't wait to directly encounter the source of her disappointment. She feels entitled to preempt Jesus' arrival. He's already late, so by now she's gained the right to phone him directly since her first text was not answered promptly. Again, Martha addresses Jesus by title, acknowledges his power to save and his direct connection to God, testaments to who Jesus is. Then Jesus replies in what seems like an obtuse manner, your loved one will rise again. Knowing she's in God's presence, Martha chooses to submit and acknowledge what Scripture says. She places her faith in resurrection on the last day rather than accuse God of being insensitive or failing to feel the pain of her loss. What Jesus says next is very important. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. His point is that resurrection is not only offered to the dead, but all whom Jesus loves. Lazarus, his sisters, the messenger, the crowd, and everyone listening. He asks us all, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Not only that I have the power to save, but the desire to do so, because I'm the one who loves you all. And this is why Jesus arrived into the world as God's Son, not too late, but right on time. 
Martha runs to grab her sister and prepares her to learn something new. The crowd follows them both thinking one thing while Jesus knows exactly what's about to happen. The stage is now full. Mary kneels at his feet and Jesus feels the full weight of her grief and her disappointment. He hears weeping among the crowd. His spirit is disturbed and that verb is described as moved, agitated like a horse snorting displeasure. His spirit addresses him vehemently. <laughs> In other places where it talks about his spirit being troubled are in John 14, 1, where he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And in John 14, 27, when he tells disciples, don't let your hearts be distressed or lacking in courage. The same disturbance of spirit describes the reaction of the disciples upon the imminent death of Jesus. And again in John, how Jesus reacts to the thought of being betrayed by Judas. Jesus responds to overwhelming emotion which is not just a mental state marked by feelings or mood, but an actual neurophysiological change that is brought on through relationships with others. Neither Jesus nor we experience emotions in a vacuum, but by virtue of our interrelatedness. We'll never live or die alone, and we're always connected to everyone, past and present, and to Jesus as God who created us. Now, as far as what Lazarus experienced, you, you, all, you a lot of you know that when a person grows really ill and then recovers, that they often have no memory of it. He had his own experience at this event, but it wasn't the same as those who witnessed his decline and death, who worried and prayed, who grieved his loss and buried him. But Jesus knows. The fact that he asked where Jesus had been laid was again for their benefit. What really disturbed Jesus and was of great concern was the curse of death itself. It was never God's intention for creation to die or for anything to suffer. Creation began as paradise and will one day be redeemed to perfection. And while it seems sad that human beings are the only animals aware of their mortality, who regularly project fear into the future, and who surrender to death only when they see no better alternative, it's really a blessing. Because together in community, we're like the crowd that was present at the grave of Lazarus. We vary in our experience of suffering and death. We vacillate between belief that God fully identifies with us while also pondering why God didn't prevent bad things from happening. And like the sisters, we worry about the stench of imperfection that might linger in the nose of other people once the stone gets rolled away and the extent of decay is revealed. <laughs> Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? All that Jesus did and does is for the sake of the crowd, so they may believe. Because others go with and comfort those who are suffering, they are also able to see all that Jesus does and believe in him too. That's ongoing redemption and resurrection. Lazarus would again, like his sisters and the members of the crowd that day, die. And like us, Lazarus could not unbind himself. Once the stone was rolled away, he still had to walk out of the cave. He still had to have other people loosen his hands and feet and unwrap his face. That was the role of the crowd. Under Jesus' command, for the glory of God to be revealed, Jesus instructs the living of what to do. 
He includes us in his plan to save and free people from death. He gives life and restores it so that everyone is forever changed. This week, or I guess it was this week, on Call the Midwife in the epilogue, they talked about change feeling threatening, but also noting that it's a chance to experience something new. Change involves seeing life events differently, trusting that our desired outcome is the same as God's. Only what God imagines is life eternal and not merely life extended. This week, I had numerous encounters with men and women of various capacities and circumstances. Some were young and strong in the, with their whole lives ahead of them, beginning budding romances, struggling to navigate peer relationships, and wondering what kind of future lay ahead. Some were near the end of life yet appeared strong in other ways, because over time they gained perspective. Life had not been easy, but was meaningful. They had endured, and that outcome produced gratitude. That's the difference between the beginning and the end of our life stories. When all is yet to be determined, we agonize over our worst fears. But once a few of those come true, we accept uncertainty as a given. What is certain is change, and without experiencing loss, there's little chance that we'll ever change. Again, at the Youth Center this week, I found something that was true, not only about youth, but myself. People often say that teenage boys and girls are impulsive. One minute they're polite, and the next minute they're rude. Truth is, I was again reminded that all ages are susceptible to being human, wanting immediate results, wanting to be treated special, to escape doing extra work, wanting attention to be heard and respected. It had been a pretty good day thus far. The kids complied with requests to sign in and choked my last nerve. I spun around to see the couches at the back, lined with teens aware of what had just happened. My instinct confronted them with the reality that I had had enough. I said, do we have to close the youth center and make everyone leave? What was that noise? Subconsciously, I was saying, someone better tell me what happened or I'm out of here. To the culprit's surprise, voices spoke up. And in my head, I laughed while hearing myself say aloud, I don't want to hear another noise like that, as if pleasing me is what really mattered. Regardless, they seemed to understand that I couldn't handle any further unexplained outbursts. The rest of the afternoon went fine. We all realized how vulnerability compensates by trying to exert control. How gratitude can devolve into expectation and how relationships are always being formed and broken, repaired, tried, and tested. The only consistent, constant source of love and understanding is God in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, our only hope is in you. We can only help but trust your timing and knowledge of all people and circumstances. You are always at work in and through us to achieve what's best for eternity. Continue to redeem and change us, for being made new always helps us grow. Challenge our way of being, so joy and meaning are the sum total of our lives lived to your glory. In your holy name we pray.
page 65. I believe in God. Staying by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Enliven your church and its people with the breath of life. Deepen partnerships between churches and organizations in the community and around the globe. Bless the work of lay persons who support and accompany them. Merciful God, your ever-present spirit brings creation to life and sustains it. Enliven the natural world and ecosystems in need of restoration. Soil, air, creatures, elements, all things upon which life depends and with which it hangs in the balance. Merciful God. Redeem the world, its people, and the relationships between them. Free those trapped in cycles of helplessness, hopelessness, ignorance, or dependency. Feed those who hunger to be filled with what we enjoy. Raise up managers, officers, and leaders throughout society who understand how to promote the dignity of every human life. Merciful God. You weep when we weep. Be present with those who grieve or who are troubled by illness, especially those on our prayer list. You love and hear us when we call to you. Deliver us from the depths of our despair and free us from worries that bind us. Merciful God. Your spirit of life dwells within and among us. Bless all who lead and worship with us in hymns of praise and thanksgiving, songs of lament and prayer. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. You are the resurrection and the life. Even though we die, we will live. With thanksgiving, we remember all your saints who now live in your eternal love. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and in the promise to renew all of creation through Jesus Christ, our friend and Savior, who along with your Holy Spirit reigns in glory and continues to reach toward us with compassion. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace.
With one voice, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Before we sing our final hymn, this is one that we uh, practiced on Ash Wednesday. I'm sure we'll be singing it again. Greta will play the tune, which was the tune you were hearing during the offering. She'll play Play through it one time, we'll sing it together five times, and then you'll be dismissed after the postlude. Love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.